Hi, my name is Rodrigo Ruano. I'm a phytosurgeon at Mayo Clinic and chair of the division of maternal phytomedicine. And today, I have the pleasure to be here with Dr. Joseph Derini and then Dr. Elizabeth Stephens, who are our pediatric cardiovascular surgeons at Mayo Clinic. And we are here to discuss today something very excited or exciting, huh? which is the um, possibility of doing fetal interventions for congenital heart defects. So, uh, Dr. Stephen, um, Elizabeth, um, which are the main uh, diseases or congenital heart problems that we can, uh, we think we can uh, treat in utero? Well, that's a great question. The vast majority of um, patients with congenital heart diseases, they grow just fine while they're in utero. So they're getting oxygenated blood from the mom and that goes to the rest of the body and the brain. But there is a subset of congenital heart diseases where the disease itself progresses or gets worse during development. And it's that specific select group of patients where there's this opportunity to use fetal cardiac intervention to either stop the progression of, or of the disease or even make it better. That's fantastic. Yeah, so Good. one of the things that um, there are a few, you know, examples that this might be and has been shown to be effective and one is hypoplastic left heart syndrome, including if they have a what's called an intact septum or aortic stenosis and narrowing of the aortic valve and then Epstein's anomaly, which at Mayo we have a lot of experience in. So maybe I'll ask Joe, you know, given all our experience here with Epstein anomaly, what do you, um, and we get a lot of fetal um, consults regarding these patients. Uh, can you comment on the referrals we get and uh, the opportunity to intervene on these uh, fetuses? Sure. So uh, it's a great uh, launching pad to talk about a lesion that we really do have a lot of experience with here. And despite this extensive experience, there's still room for a lot of improvement. So Epstein anomaly is an anomaly of the right ventricle and the tricuspid valve. And it's really the only lesion where the spectrum of clinical presentation can be a symptomatic neonate to an asymptomatic adult that's not even identified until the adult years and everything in between. And the symptomatic neonate still is sort of the one lesion that really haunts the surgeon when surgery is required. Even in the current day where the results of surgery for hypoplastic left heart syndrome have gotten to a very low mortality, when surgery is required in the newborn with Epstein anomaly, it still carries high mortality. And so we need to make it better. And I know that we've worked together to talk about what those options would be. And, and the problem is, is it's such a drastic anatomic abnormality with the heart that it results in poor development of the lungs. Mm -hmm. And if we can intervene a little bit earlier on to not avoid the need for surgery, but make the performance of the child after birth a little more stable and allow us to sort of collect our thoughts evaluate, get the proper imaging, and do surgery in a controlled manner as opposed to, you know, a chaotic, urgent type of situation. Not only will the risk of surgery be lower, but the long-term outlook um, would likely be better. So I think we have an opportunity here. Great. And then uh, you mentioned about hypoplastic left heart syndrome mm -hmm. and chew. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit about hypoplastic left heart syndrome and then uh, aortic, aortic stenosis? And then uh, I can... Uh, help, I can, we can discuss a little bit about uh, the interventions that we can do right. for, the, for that situation or those situations. So good question. Hypoplastic left heart syndrome is when the left side of the heart, so the mitral valve, the left ventricle, and the aortic valve are small. Um, and in those cases, they are not able to supply enough blood uh, to the body. So um, among those lesions, aortic stenosis, in other words, where the aortic valve is there but it's small, that's one of the lesion sets where they've demonstrated that intervening as a fetus can be helpful. They, as Joe has mentioned, they still need surgery after they're born, but that can improve their overall outcome and their stability. Exactly. This is one, is one example of surgeries that we are currently doing uh, before the babies are born. So uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, where the left heart of the, uh, the left heart doesn't develop very well, and we have aortic stenosis, we can put a tiny needle inside the heart of the fetus of the baby before the, the baby is born, and try to dilate the, uh, the, 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 the aortic stenosis, or try to dilate the aorta, and to improve the heart. 
So the success rate, rate of this procedure nowadays is about 85%. So 85% we are able to perform the procedure and then in 50% of the times we can, we can create a biventricle uh, situation. So we can have two hearts, we can save the left heart. And then uh, this is one option that we, can, we are offering now, and then uh, maybe with Epstein we can do something too in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> uh, we have some examples of fetal interventions that we can show, and then, uh, but afterwards I would like to come back to Epstein anomalies. Sure. So uh, nowadays we can offer many different types of fetal interventions. We can offer fetoscopic repair that we can put a tiny scopes a tiny scope inside the, the maternal, the uterus, uh, the maternal abdomen and inside the uterus and we can treat the fetus or we can open the uterus. Uh, I have one example, for example, congenital diaphragmatic hernia. This is an example of a normal fetus, uh, 28 weeks, and then uh, we are going to see a fetus with congenital diaphragmatic hernia, which is a hole in the diaphragm, the muscle that separates the chest and the belly. And then we have the herniation of the stomach, liver, and bowel inside the chest. And by consequence, the lungs and the heart are pushed against the other direction. And then the lungs, they don't develop very well. So what, what can we do for that? So these babies, they develop something called as pulmonary hypoplasia, small, smaller lungs. So at 28 weeks, we just, we can introduce a tiny telescope inside the uterus. Uh, you're going to see now under ultrasound guidance uh, with local anesthesia, so some sedation to the mom, and then we introduce a tiny telescope inside the amniotic cavity, inside the mouth of the baby, inside the trachea, and we deploy a detachable balloon that will promote lung growth. And this balloon stays there for 28 weeks until 34 weeks. And then the lungs expand, increase, and grow. And then these babies, they will have better chance to do better after birth. And then at 34 weeks, we remove the balloon using the same technique, and then those patients can have vaginal delivery. The babies, too, the babies with congenital diaphragmatic hernia that uh, underwent or undergo to this procedure, they still need to go to the NICU, but they have better chance of survival. And then another example is that uh, we can open the uterus and, and, and sometimes to expose, for example, the back of the baby. And may, we may be able and we want to expose the heart of the babies. So the next video that I would like to show is about spina bifida. So we do a laparotomy, so we open the mother's belly and then uh, we uh, open the uterus, we use ultrasound guidance, and then we just open the uterus a little bit, we identify, we put the baby's back up, uh, and then we identify the defect in the baby's spinal or the baby's back, which, which uh, that's the, the, the image. So the baby's back doesn't close very well, we call spina bifida, and using special uh, devices nowadays, we can safely open the uterus and expose the baby's back and then, uh, by, and then the neurosurgeon can come and close, uh, and close uh, the defect uh, uh, and, uh, as this, in the same way that we would do postnatally. And by doing this, we improve a lot the outcomes of these babies. So those are the examples of surgeries that we can do, we can offer in utero. How can we improve the condition before the babies are born? Uh, thanks, uh, Rodrigo. You've alluded to um, indirectly the personnel that are involved. <laughs> You've mentioned NICU and surgery and, and of course your team. And the success of all this, it depends on, on teams, um, multidisciplinary teams where you're bringing various specialties together, each sort of bringing a particular skill set. And I think one of the things that you will appreciate is the number of people involved and everybody has a specific responsibility and, and each role that that person or that group of people plays is, is essential to the outcome. And so now we would be taking that squad of personnel and we would be trying to do what we have been doing postnatally, prenatally. And we have a protocol in place to do this for Epstein Anomaly and you and I have worked together in the operating room. The three of us have seen what's possible. And uh, this is something that I think could be a game changer, you know, for these babies. And 
we have not been able to dramatically change the mortality for surgery in this newborn, with this newborn lesion, despite the advances and the improvements with so many other lesions, this one is still the one that, uh, that keeps us up at night the day before surgery. And uh, this is a chance, I think, to make it better, so. Thank you, Joe. And uh, how do you think is going to improve that? So, um... well, I think the, 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 under, the fundamental problem is the heart becomes so large, they develop heart failure from the heart problem, but also in addition to the heart being large, it compromises the development of the lungs. So if we're able to perhaps at the 28 week mark, I mean, we would have to defer to your judgment about what would be the best time. But if we're able to reduce the size of the heart at a time when it's very, very large to allow space for the lungs to develop during the remaining portion of the pregnancy, so that at the time of birth, the lungs are, are, are large enough that they can support the circulation with the defective heart to allow us to not rush into surgery, you know, let the dust settle, stabilize everything with the neonatal ICU team, and then proceed with surgery in a more controlled fashion. And there might be some situations where you'd actually sneak through the, new, the newborn period without needing surgery. I mean, that of course would be the dream because the risk of surgery dr drops dramatically once you get beyond the first month or two of life. So all of this would be a step in the right direction for improvement. And I, I mean, we, we, can, we can do this. That's amazing. So uh, as you mentioned, the multidisciplinary collaboration is crucial for the success of those procedures. And then uh, here we are discussing about a situation that's very severe because of heart and lung problems. So if we, if we can improve at least the lung condition and, and, and minimize the cardiac condition or uh, complications, that would be fantastic. And we have the tools to do this here. And we have, as you mentioned, a protocol for that. So we are starting this protocol and hopefully we'll be successful because our main goal here is to keep delivering hope to the patients and to the families and to get, to give better chance for those babies and for those mothers. Elizabeth, anything you wanted to add? Well, I think we touched on this some, but um, these fetal interventions for the, the vast majority are uh, attempting to either slow down the progression of the disease or alleviate some of the disease, but it's not the be all or end all for most of the cardiac lesions. So these are things that um, enable the uh, prognosis to be better, but they sh the family should still expect postnatally that the babies will require surgery. But again, the overall goal is to improve the prognosis of the of the babies. So, thank you. You said hope, and I think that that is the that is our departing word, because there still are a fair number of mothers that choose to terminate pregnancy because of this lesion. Exactly. And we don't want that. I mean, we want to come up with a strategy that provides hope with, uh, with a predictable and reliable chance for a good outcome. That's our goal here. Yes. That's what we want to do, and that's what we are going to do. And we are studying that a lot, and we are studying prenatal imaging, uh, methods that we can use to predict the lung function, predict heart function, and also we improve the te technique, this cardiac, card cardiovascular surgery technique. So we are progressing very well. The future is here. The today. future is here today. So I would like to thank you so much, Joe, and thank you also, Elizabeth, for how your work and collaboration with us, too. And then I would like to thank everybody who are listening to us. And then uh, if you have questions, we'll be happy to hear uh, to answer those questions afterwards. So thank you.